Hello, welcome to another one of my Dr. Sadler Chalk and Talk installments. This time I am responding to a set of questions that were sent to me uh, through a different channel than, I, than I've usually gotten them. Most of them so far have been through VU. However, this one actually came in response to one of my Chalk and Talk videos, uh, number three, where I talked about teaching religion in, in public schools and, and how that could be allowable and what clarifications have to be made. So uh, somebody asked me, do you have any advice for when students may perhaps have approached you as to which religion is true? And if so, did they persist more than once? And then they followed this up by asking, as teachers, are we permitted to refer them to textual sources that may or may not be academic? So these are some really good and important questions. And I wanted to uh, address this in, in this follow-up. And I think I can actually get both of these in. We're, we're uh, already one minute in. And let's see if I can get it in in under 15 minutes. So basically what we're looking for here is advice for when students ask the inevitable question, which religion is true? And if you think about it, even if we've adopted the religious studies model, why are we teaching about religion? Why are we investigating these things? Why are we introducing the students to these? Well, because religions are bodies of belief, practices, communities, uh, historical narratives that people throughout time have considered not only to be true, but to be transcendently true, to be uh, teaching them about what is, you might say, absolutely true, not merely relatively true, but, but true in the deepest sense. So it's, it's inevitable that this question will come up. And I think the key thing to do is to turn it into a set of teachable moments. Uh, and I've got a little bit of advice for how to do that. The first thing I would suggest is asking this set of questions. True? Well, in what sense? Is, do we mean this? Do we mean that by saying that one religion is true, that it is most correct about God or the nature of the divine or the gods or you know uh, an economy of, of the divine or who, who knows? There's, there's a lot of different uh, possibilities there. Um, every religion has not only origin stories but also a number of teachings about the nature of human beings. What, what are they made of? What do they return to? Um, how do they tie in with the divine? Are they made, for example, in God's image, as uh, you find in uh, Judaism and, and Christianity? Um, what does that actually mean, you know, to be made in, in God's image? Um, somebody like uh, Thomas Aquinas would say it's primarily through our function of reason. A philosopher like Rene Descartes said through having an unlimited will. Um, Clement of Alexandria actually connected it to music uh, in, a, in a beautiful piece, said that um, we, in, in that we sing and that we produce music, are most like the divine. So that's, those are things that uh, religions talk about, and they could be more true or, or less true, right? The world, or not just the world that we, we see, but the entire world, the cosmos, where did it come from? Where is it going to? Uh, is it cyclical? Are there more worlds than one? Those are things that religion takes stands on. Life and death, this is really key. Um, you know, if you think about it, where does the rubber really meet the road for some of the disagreements? Think about the difference between three basic stances. One stance could be, well, you live, you die, that's it. Right? The big sleep, the dirt nap, as they call it. Um, that's one position. Other uh, people say, well, there's a good place and there's a bad place. You know, you know, the good place is above. And if you're more or less good, you wind up in the good place. Or, you know, if God takes mercy on you or something like that. And if you're bad, you end up in the bad place. And, and the bad thing is, once you're in the bad place, you're not getting out. But the consolation is, if you make it into the good place, you're staying there, too. Uh, or could it be that it's, that it's cyclical? Um, as in uh, religions that believe in reincarnation. Could it be that there's uh, a whole system of merit 
and uh, demerit so that what you do in a previous life affects where you go the next life through a variety of mechanisms. Well, those are different positions, and those positions, at least as far as the ultimate truth of them, are not actually compatible. Um, so, it's natural that people would ask about this and want to know, especially young students. They want to know. You're teaching us all about these different religions. Which one is actually true? Get them to ask about these things, and then get them to uh, think about other things. I have another set of things tied in with, with teachable moments. First, I'd like to tell you about what I did when I taught religious studies at Indiana State Prison. Um, I'm actually a Roman Catholic, so I'm, I'm a Christian. I belong to the, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I'll actually worship at a Maronite uh, Catholic Church, an Eastern Rite Church currently, because I love the liturgy. I had to conceal my Catholic identity from my students when I was teaching in the prison, and there were several good reasons why that was the case. Um, I needed to, for one thing, I needed to maintain a certain sort of reserve, uh, in part because there was already a lot of anti-Catholic prejudice um, among some of the religious groups, and for me to be revealed as, as Catholic would have led to some of them saying, you can't possibly teach in an unbiased way, you're going to be favoring your group. And that, that, that could be a legitimate concern, because there, there may be um, some cases where people are unable to keep themselves from doing so. Um, what I would point out to them is that if I'm doing my job right as an instructor of religious studies, then it should not matter what religious group I belong to, what traditions I uphold, what my practices are, um, other than you know, which days I have to take off, or Done. Um, but if I am actually doing my job well, I'm not saying that this is this is perfect, or that anybody can embody this and, and never falter in this respect. If I'm doing my job well, then it shouldn't matter whether I am a Roman Catholic Christian, an Eastern Orthodox Christian, a Lutheran Christian, a Pentecostal Christian. You know, it shouldn't matter whether I'm a uh, Sunni Muslim, a Shiite Muslim, shouldn't matter uh, whether I'm a Buddhist of this school, this school, this school. Um, I should be teaching about people's religions and treating them all in a fairly sympathetic way that also has a certain reserve where I don't commit myself. Um, there was one other concern too. I didn't want people to know that I was Catholic because then the Catholic students might try to get over on me, right? They would assume that their fellow uh, co-religionist would, would be um, doing them favors. And I didn't want that either. It was really ironic, too, because I had so many students. There was a large Catholic presence at uh, Indiana State Prison. And I had so many students from the Catholic Church in my classes explaining to me what uh, church doctrine was, not knowing that I was actually Catholic, and that I was teaching catechesis class uh, on Sunday mornings. Um, that's just, you know, what took place for me. Um, I'm not saying that that has to be the paradigm. I think it's useful to teach students about the various attitudes that religious groups do take towards truth. Not only the truth of their uh, perspective, but the truth of other perspectives. And these are terms that we, we typically use in religious studies to talk about these. One of them is actually quite new, parallelism. Um, an exclusivist says that they have the absolute truth and everybody else is basically wrong um, except insofar as they coincide with them. Uh, and some would go so far as to say, well, even if you have any admixture of error, you're just completely wrong. Um, some examples of exclusivists would be uh, Christian fundamentalists. Fundamentalists in the strict sense of the term where it does not include evangelicals, but hardcore fundamentalists. Um, that would be an example of exclusivists. Inclusivists believe that
their faith is the right faith, is the truest faith, but that other, um, other traditions, other faiths, other groups, they are not completely wrong, and as a matter of fact, they may be on the right track, sometimes without even recognizing it or, or believing it. The Roman Catholic Church's doctrine on this, and, and the other older Christian uh, churches as well, so Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, Syriac, all these other churches, that seems to be their position. Um, Sunni Muslims, insofar as they, their view is that Jews and Christians are not totally wrong, as a matter of fact, we're the people of the book, and we've gotten some things right. We just, you know, we got mixed up about who that Jesus guy was, or, or you know, the nature of the Torah and, and the, the, the covenant with humanity, or, or who was the first Muslim, or things like that. Um, and we're also mistaken about, about Muhammad. That would be uh, inclusivist. They're not saying, uh, you guys are completely wrong. They're saying, um, you are off on, on some things in certain respects. A pluralist would be somebody who is saying um, something along the lines of, well, they're all equally right. Um, they just have different ways of getting to the same basic place. Uh, John Hick would be a great example of a classic pluralist. He uh, made a lot of arguments for that. Um, to some degree, you could see Hinduism as practiced by, by many Hindus as pluralist. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you ask Hindus, what do you think about that Jesus guy? Um, they will say, yeah, some of them will say, he's an avatar, um, you know, one, one face of God. Um, some of them actually say that about Muhammad, which tends to drive Muslims nuts. Um, relativists are going a little bit further than pluralists. They're saying, well, it's all just up to the individual or the, the group, and whatever's right for them is right for them. And there's a little incoherence in that position, which I'm not going to try to explore. And then there's an interesting new way of thinking about this. I'm not sure it's radically new, but to give it a name and to single it out is kind of new. And they, they speak of parallelism or being a parallelist. And the idea behind that is you're saying that um, the, different, the different religions are not on the same track to exactly the same truth. Uh, rather, you know, the, the Christian is aiming for the Trinitarian Christian God, um, and the, uh, the Muslim is aiming for, you know, eternal life with, with uh, Allah and paradise, and these are not exactly the same. This is a complicated issue, and I'm going to actually close that off right here. Um, here's another thing to think about. What, what truth claims can we or do we have to make without endorsing when we're teaching religious studies? There's quite a few. Um, when we are saying, for example, a religion has a certain amount of adherence, that's a truth claim. It's either, it's either correct or not. And it's not requiring us to be committed to that religion in order to say that. If I say, for example, Buddhists believe in the Four Noble Truths, um, and here is what they say the Four Noble Truths are. I am making a truth claim, but again, I am not committing myself to the ultimate truth of, you know, the Four Noble Truths as being religious doctrine, um, whether they're, they're correct or not, whether the Buddhists have all of this stuff correct. As to the question of recommending texts, this is kind of along the same line. That's why I've been heading to, to this point. If you're recommending a text to a student, what are you doing? You're providing them with resources to more fully understand what it is that you're talking about, the religions, doctrines on all of these things. So if I hand, if a student asks me about what do Muslims believe, and I hand him or her a copy of the Quran or I hand a collection of the Hadith, um, that's a, not an academic book. Um, I am not there by saying this is truth, this is absolutely correct. I am actually saying um, this is what they believe, this is important to them. You can study this, and I think that's completely appropriate. Uh, so long as you're not endorsing it. 